Uh, welcome back. Thank you very much indeed for sticking with us for uh, the final section of Pitches. And this session is under the banner of system efficiency. So we're going to kick straight off with the first of uh, your final section of Pitches. Please welcome uh, Alicia from Greedy City to kick things off. Please put your hands together for her. Hi, everyone. My name is Alicia, and I'm the founder of Gridicity. We make software for intelligent electric vehicle charging. What air traffic control does for busy skies, we do for electric vehicle charging in busy cities. So you've got a limited supply and a limited resource, a lot of demand. So obviously, we've seen a growing uptake of electric vehicle adoption in the UK and globally, and it's only expected to increase. It is largely seen to be the low carbon solution. However, what's really critical is that we charge those vehicles at the right time. And if we can do that, then we're able to still keep that low carbon. So um, a lot of businesses, especially, are electrifying their fleets and my solution targets a sort of a, a commercial fleet uh, business. And the way that it would do this is by using uh, a software solution to optimize the charging. So I'm gonna give you an example. Um, a business wants to electrify their fleet. They're a delivery fleet. They've got about 10 small vans that they wanna okay, electrify. Now, they're gonna face several problems if they just switch like this, they plug in when they come back. And that's largely what we're seeing in the sort of trials that I've noticed in the industry is that those fleets are coming back to depot, plugging in and charging up at peak hours. So this is, this is definitely something we want to address now. That, that fleet is going to face three main problems. The first one is that those prices, the energy prices at that peak time, uh, are the highest. Not only are the, the energy prices the highest, if they come back and they all plug in and they charge up, they're most likely going to be breaching their capacity limits so this, on the site, so they might incur penalties for that as well. So our software is able to uh, control that charging for the best time, not just to avoid that capacity breach, but also for energy prices. Um, the second problem this fleet are likely going to face is that if we all uh, if they come back and, and they're charging at peak time, then this puts a big strain on the grid and they will likely be uh, risking blackouts. If, if we all adopt this behavior, they'll be risking blackouts and, and penalty fees. So with our software, again, the solution there is to move that charging, control that charging in an intelligent way. And actually, that will provide a new revenue stream. So as more demand comes on the network, uh, network operators will be, will be compensating uh, companies and, and uh, others for not, not charging at peak. So that's another uh, solution. The third problem they're going to face is that as they wanted to decrease their carbon emissions, actually if they're charging at that time, um, that's probably the highest intensity carbon generation uh, that they could possibly target. So that demand for the energy is going to be met by, by fossil fuel plants. So by, again, moving that, responding to certain signals, so considering all those different signals, our software will then choose the best time for the best cost, for the most compensation in terms of uh, not charging at peak and for lowest carbon, you have this nicely packaged solution that's good for the company, for the environment. So uh, at Gridisi, we are starting our trials in the coming months. and. If anyone here knows any electric vehicle fleets, any commercial fleets or companies that want to electrify or that are installing charge points, I would be very happy if you put us in touch and you can come and find me afterwards. Thank you. Over to uh, questions now. And uh, again, a reminder to scan the QR code on the screen behind us and use menti.com to get those questions in. Um, Alicia, starting with one about what makes you different from what's already out there. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I think <clears throat> specialising in this, in this 
place between where the electric vehicles are sort of the hardware side, the fleets and the hardware being installed, and the energy markets. I think there's an opportunity that I've identified whereby, um, yeah, you know, by optimizing for across those multiple streams, you can you can target that market best. Yeah. Um, another question about what are the biggest barriers to um, EV adoption for particularly commercial fleets? Yeah. So the first one is going to be the price of, of the electric vehicles. That's not something that I am um, trying to address. But after that, once that investment's been made uh, by the company, I think installing the infrastructure and particularly with a lot of issues around network, I can talk about that all day. If anyone wants to listen to me later on, <laughs> they can come and talk to me. But there's a big queue, for example, for getting higher capacity, uh, a higher capacity connection at your site. Um, so one way to address that is actually to control the charging. So to have this dynamic load management algorithm that will allow you to have the chargers and to, and to use your electric vehicles, but not have to pay big upgrade costs. We've had a question in about how the um, solution works. What hardware does it need to work? Sure. So um, it needs any uh, charge point that that is smart. So so we, we use a protocol, which is the uh, open charge point protocol, uh, which is sort of industry standard. So as long as you've got a charge point that's smart, that's newish, then it would be smart. Um, we can control it via the cloud anywhere as long as it's got a connection. Um, who do you see as your uh, customers, CPOs, hardware manufacturers, end customers? Yeah, so uh, there are two. Uh, the CPO, so that's a charge point operator, that's definitely a customer, um, because we can achieve a certain amount of scale. So the, the charge point operators are the ones who will do the back end for the chargers, so they'll do uh, you know, your billing, your maintenance for your chargers, etc. Um, so by partnering with them, we could reach more customers uh, just via API. We could provide our solution to them. And then the other way would be direct to fleets. So going to the fleet and then maybe bringing in a charge point operator or ideally, as I scale, uh, doing that function myself uh, as well. Uh, a question about the difference from existing competitors already doing this. So Fuse, this audience member says, is a big player, Fuse. for example. Fuse, yes. Fuse is one of my project partners in my previous project, so I know them quite well. Yeah, um, Fuse are a charge point op operator who will also do this uh, dynamic load management, so they'll help you not go over your capacity limit. They're not in the, uh, not in all of those segments that I discussed around lower carbon, for example. Um, getting into uh, the grid services, so where I talked about uh, avoiding the peak, um, but I think by being, uh, by targeting the, that space in between fleets and energy market, um, I think I've got an edge. You can come and talk to me later if you, if you want to yeah, about that more, in more detail. Uh, how similar and or different are you to Go Eve? Go Eve. Unfortunately, I haven't heard of Go Eve, so um, I don't know. Again, perhaps one if you'd like to elaborate further networking later yes, on yes, that could be a conversation for then um, i think we have time for one final question and uh no that brings us to time thank you very okay. much indeed all right thank you very much uh, yes and just a reminder if you have any further questions you can get the chance to speak to uh, all the innovators uh, later on um next up we have a uh, team design wise please put your hands together for felix What always struck me during that time was how little attention is paid to the environmental impact of the choices designers make. And yet these choices really matter because they're multiplied by mass manufacturing and a small decision can end up having a huge impact. In fact, the EU estimates that 80% of product environmental impact can be influenced at the design stage. So making good decisions is really important, but it's also incredibly hard. 
You see, traditionally, designers are trained to be user-centric. But to make products better for the planet, they can't stop there. Instead, they need to optimize the entire life cycle of a product. Most designers simply don't have the necessary skills and experience to do this. Now, the problem is not information. There are tens of thousands of academic papers, material databases, and life cycle assessments. The problem is that design projects are fast paced and iterative, and designers need relevant information about their specific design problem instantly. Current tools are clunky. They take weeks to produce any meaningful results, and they have steep learning curves, which is why they're simply not used in product development, even though that's where they could have the biggest impact. This is where DesignWise comes in. DesignWise connects designers with this wealth of information via a simple chat interface. This way, designers can get relevant information rapidly at every step of the design process, from analyzing existing products to coming up with new ideas, selecting sustainable materials, comparing different concepts, and finally convincing superiors or clients. DesignWise can help with all of those. We're in early beta right now with three product designers, and so far the feedback has been great. It's easy to integrate it into the design process, it allows me to offer additional services, and it even saves us the cost of hiring an expert. We're now extending this beta stage, so if you're interested, please get in touch. Over the coming months, we transform this prototype into a fully-fledged software solution with different pricing tiers for individual designers, startups and studios, and enterprise customers. We're launching this at the Q1 next year. We're targeting profitability in the second year of operation in 2025 and more than a million in revenue in 2027. At that point, we'll help to save 20,000 tons of CO2 equivalent. Now, if you're an early stage investor and you're interested in this proposition, I would love to start engaging with you. Equally, if you're working in the manufacturing space or if you're in product development, we would love to get in touch to show you our product. So with this, it's been an honor to present here. Um, this is DesignWise. My name is Felix. Thank you very much. Uh, well done, Felix. Uh, let's take questions now, uh, and please do just scan the QR code on the screen above us. Um, Felix, starting with one about your market size, what is it? So eventually, we want to help redesign everything. And everything is a lot, and it's made by a lot of manufacturers. So there's six and a half million manufacturers out there. Not all of them have internal product uh, development departments, uh, and not all of those care about sustainability. But those that, to, that do are still 250,000 companies. Um, and that gives us a market size with the pricing tiers we saw earlier of four billion uh, pounds. We've had a question in about how you compare to other AI tools, so the likes of OpenAI. Yeah, so our solution is specialized. So if you try, for example, on OpenAI, uh, finding a specific carbon footprint for recycled aluminum from China, you won't get it. Um, so we're we kind of specialized on this niche use case. Um, so that's, that's how we differ from OpenAI. We, use, uh, we actually use OpenAI at the moment in one of the prototypes. So we use their large language model uh, connected to our curated database. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of how that interacts. Okay. Um, are there any specific products that you're targeting initially? Yeah. So uh, mainly manufacturing goods. So that ranges from, I don't know, household appliances uh, to all kinds of electronics. Um, so, so mainly uh, our, our target customers are industrial designers. So anything they design uh, should be designed more sustainable. And that's, that's our target. And do you have any plans to integrate into uh, designers' workflows and tools? This, uh, we haven't done this yet. It's something we're looking at, but I think, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of a separate uh, application. So you can see some eco-analysis is integrated in SolidWorks, but it's, it's, it's sort of a little bit uh, sketchy. And I think, I think ours is more sort of this co-pilot uh, that you carry across all, all the different other expectations, uh, applications that you use. 
Um, we have a question in about how open designers are to using products like yours. <laughs> Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, we've only worked with sort of a small sample for now. But um, what's cool is that designers, they know that design is a problem, right? It's, it's sort of very, very uh, known. And uh, yeah, the ones we worked uh, with said, hey, this is a really cool tool, uh, can save us the cost of hiring an expert. Um, and so uh, pretty open. They're also generally early adopters, um, designers. So um, yeah. Uh, any further questions, I think? Uh, yes, is your solution suitable for industrial design of, for example, chemical parks? I mean, in theory, yes, we're more targeted on the sort of the product scale. Um, but I think, yeah, that's sort of something, uh, once we've um, exploited our beachhead market, I think definitely uh, can look into different industries. I, I thought first of sort of fashion and architecture. Um, in theory, can help AI help with this? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's not our beachhead market, though. And do you plan to build your own base models um, moving away from open AI? For now, no, because I think there's not really a need for this. There's, there's sort of many uh, models available. Um, the, the design of our application is pretty modular, so we can sort of swap out the, the model that we're using. Uh, for example, use an open source model instead, cut costs. Um, and I, I don't think there's a reason why we would need our own base model. Brilliant. Um, that brings us to time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Um, and many thanks for your questions. That brings us on to the third pitch of this section. Please put your hands together to the, uh, for the CEO of Tactic, Giuseppe. We all like the convenience of online shopping, right? But is producing a huge amount of paper and cardboard waste. It is mostly recycled, yes, but even if it's recycled, it still needs lots of water, it still needs lots of energy, and it still needs lots of virgin fiber. Hi, my name is Giuseppe Fasano, I'm the co-founder of TACTUK. We help retailers lessen the amount of packaging they use for their online uh, retailing with patent pending design, um, which is innovative and help them reduce the, uh, the amount they, they use and also enabling reuse. Um, our packaging has been tested by the Belgian Post. We are currently talking with Adidas in view of a pilot, and also with a number of retailers such as Zalando. So what are we exactly proposing? Um, a first way to reduce packaging waste is to ship in own container. And we are proposing this currently for footwear um, brands. Over one billion pair of shoes are sold online every year. And that is what you get if you buy a pair of shoes online. So it's the shoes in the shoe box, and the shoe box in another box. In this particular case, it's an extra 330 gram of packaging. It can replace that box with a small sealing strip and eliminate thousands of tons of packaging. It is simply inserted through a slit on the lid of the box, and then it's attached to it, and it's ready to be posted. Another way we can reduce packaging waste is to reuse the packaging retailers receive back with returned orders. Returned orders are very high, especially in fashion retailing. Just in Germany, over 500 million returns are made every year. So at the moment, all this packaging which is received back is just disposed for recycling. But with our innovation, a box can be opened and closed many times which means that when a retailers receive a parcel back, they can reuse to fulfill another order. 
And that, of course, saves lots of money because they have to buy less packaging. An example, Zalanto could save more than six billion uh, pounds a year in less packaging to, to buy. So we can lower the cost for retailers. We can lower the amount of waste and greenhouse emission they produce, and also enhance their reputation and eco-credential with their customer. If you'd like to connect with you today, if you could introduce, introduce us to a retailer or a brand that can have a part with us and benefit from our innovation. Thank you. Well done. And uh, over to you for questions now, uh, and starting with one about how you intend to make profit. So uh, we make profit by licensing our IP. Um, so we have patent pending status, and we license to both the retailer and packaging manufacturers. So retailers, they save money because they need to buy less packaging. So a portion of that saving is a fee for us. And for packaging manufacturing, we can increase their revenue. And so a portion of that increase in revenue is actually paid for us as a fee for the LP. Um, how about whether shoppers are ready for this? Uh, are people who buy products ready to receive their orders without that secondary box that they're used to receiving? Yeah. Um, so um, for football, uh, foot, footwear retailing, um, there are already a number of brands that have redesigned the shoe box, they're mainly direct-to-consumer brands, um, all birds comes to mind, and they already designed the box, so it doesn't need a second box when it's posted to a customer. <laughs> However, in their very design, they have um, this more material, so it's much more heavy. That means that for a company, normal company that sells perhaps 25% online, 75% offline, if they increase the packaging weight for all the shoe box, then there's a waste of packaging. So that is the solution we only address for online shopping. We've had a question in about how Tactic compares to its competitors. Um, we are the only one which is 100% plastic free. So there are all the reusable packaging proposals out there, but they all involve uh, some sort of plastic. and. That is a problem because not everyone returns the packaging. Uh, with us, even if the packaging is just, it's not returned, it's disposed, you don't create any plastic uh, waste. And another question about how um, reluctant retailers are to try um, the pilot, and how was Adidas's response? How did they, uh, did they place an MOU or order for it? So we are still initial talk now with, with Adidas. They're looking to have about 100,000 uh, units trial. Uh, and then that, hopefully that shows them the benefit. Um, I think it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of money to save. Uh, retailers are basically throwing out money by throwing out packaging. And I think they, they will understand it quite, quite easily. OK. Um, can you uh, describe how it would work for clothes that don't normally come in um, ex existing boxes or robust packaging? How? Uh, so if we're sending clothes rather than shoes, how would that work? So, yeah, we, we close them with, um, less, uh, they, they buy a very small amount and then it's sent in a, in, a, in a paper bag, but usually the box is the most common type of packaging is used. So. Yeah, the, the, and then we can reuse the, mm -hmm. these boxes. Um, compared to your competitors, one uh, audience member asks, how do you compare in terms of the cost to retailers? So we save money for the retailers. So very, very price competitive. All the reusable packaging, uh, they can be more expensive. But ours, we actually save lots of costs to the retailer. Brilliant. Do we have any further questions? No, that brings us to time. Thank you very much okay. indeed. Thank you. And uh, time for our penultimate pitch for this section now. Um, and uh, please welcome Ben and Cohen and put your hands together for Team Nodem. <laughs> Sorry. 
So nearly half of all households in the UK cannot charge an electric vehicle from home. Now we at Nodem are determined to make accessible EV charging available for more people. I've really fucked up, haven't I? <laughs> so we're determined to accelerate. A I'm really sorry about this. It's quite funny, it's amazing how you can do this thing so many times in your kitchen, and then all of a sudden you stand up in front of the stage, and it completely changes things. So I'm going to start again. Half of all households in the UK cannot charge an electric vehicle from home. Now, we at Nodem are determined to accelerate electric vehicle adoption by making home charging more accessible to more people. Now, the problem with not being able to charge from home is fundamentally down to money. It is four to five times cheaper to charge an electric, an electric vehicle from home than it is from the public charging network. And we know that this is a barrier to EV adoption because 85% of people today who drive electric vehicles can have, have a driveway or a garage where they can charge their, their vehicle. And this is why we've created ChargeBridge. So ChargeBridge is a revolutionary fold-out semi-private charge point. Once purchased by the resident, it is installed directly on the side of the building. The bridge then folds out and the cable is extended to begin charging. Once <coughs> charged, the bridge folds back into the stowed position. This process enables more people than ever to access the benefits of e-mobility. And indeed, ChargeBridge is cheaper, easier to install, and more accessible. Drivers park on street, but charge using their own cheaper overnight home tariff, which is also of generally lower carbon intensity. ChargeBridge critically avoids costly groundworks and does not disrupt the footpath. Both important factors for scalability. Finally, ChargeBridge can be shared amongst residents. This further lowers the barrier to entry and increases uptake of EVs. So why now? Currently, there are 1.3 million electric cars on British roads. This is unbelievable. <laughs> and 60%, 60% of people state that they will not buy an electric vehicle unless they can actually charge from home. And as we're starting to see more affordable electric vehicles come onto the market, there are going to be more and more people who are looking for a proposition such as ChargeBridge that allows them to connect their home to their electric vehicle. Now, in terms of where we're at at the moment, we have a granted patent here in the UK. We're setting up trials with a tier one council, and we've got a delegation from the Office for Zero Emissions Vehicles visiting us early next month. We so, have a clear route to market, and we're currently discussing with a number of EV infrastructure installers about how uh, about our route to market, and we're going to be primarily a business-to-business-to-consumer -to -business -to -consumer proposition in the first instance, but we're also mindful of the ability to generate recurring revenue through offering grid services and co-charging possibilities. So, our vision is for everyone to have equal access to healthy, sustainable EV transport, no matter where you live. We're looking for partners and investors who also share this vision and want to join us and bridging the charge gap. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Is it, is it I can't believe it. Well done. Um, now it's time for uh, questions. And we kick off with one about how um, Noden compares to current solutions. OK, so obviously I, I, I touched on the fact that uh, charging from home is fundamentally cheaper. So if you have the ability to charge from home, that's going to save you money. Now, if you're wanting to install a wall box, just a standard wall box on your home, the prices range from anywhere about 700 pounds to 1200 pounds. Now, and that's if you've got a driveway. There are other solutions, including ones where they cut a, a channel in the gully, which are being trialed by a few local authorities. But even the cheapest one of those is around about a thousand pounds. And that's not including the wall box as well. So that would be probably about 16, 1600 or so in terms of the cost. Now, we're going to come in at a slightly higher price point than that, but we are offering a, a solution that is uh, much more user-friendly and accessible. Uh, we, we're looking at a, a payoff, a CapEx payoff for the consumer 
of around about two to three years. So the average driver will be able to pay it off within two to three years. For someone who was maybe a working driver, such as a taxi driver or a delivery driver, who might be doing 40,000 miles a year, the capex will be paid off a lot, lot quicker. So that, that's the way we're selling our proposition. Um, another question asks about um, what response you've had from local councils so far. So local councils have been varied. Um, certainly some uh, are, are happily trialling it with us, and that's one of the ones that we're looking at up in towards Scotland way. Um, other councils are a little bit uh, more risk averse. Uh, but one of the things that they are uh, staring at is the fact is the ability to, to roll out electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and that's going to be a huge stress on their, their budgets. A lot of the roads uh, people in the local authorities are quite keen on the solution because it doesn't involve cutting into their precious pavements, at which they're understandably very worried. So I think once we have a couple of local authorities who are on board, we'll start to see a lot more get involved. I'm leading on from that, a question about whether you need planning permission to install your product. Um, yeah, you'll definitely need planning permission. Uh, obviously, we're working on getting some more, uh, working towards a sort of semi-blanket ruling uh, for different councils, but everyone has different rules for these types of things, so, yeah. Within the primary legislation, there is, uh, in the Highways Act, there is uh, the ability for local authorities to give permission for the authority responsible for the roads permission to overhang the highway. So that, that actually exists within the primary legislation. We've had a question about the challenges around health and safety, given this is an overhead solution of being installed in public spaces. Yeah, so um, we have, uh, we, you'll, you'll be pleased to know we've already um, done a lot of safety testing and our current prototype can easily withstand someone hanging off of it. So often the question as we get is what happens if a um, drunk, probably a bloke, hangs off of it on the way home <laughs> from the pub. But uh, rest assured that we have uh, design our product with us in mind. And one of the other things that we, we um, have looked at, uh, Ben's been talking with insurers, and uh, one positive from our perspective is that if someone does injure themselves from this way, that they would have tampered with our product. Um, this is in opposed to something like a gully where you've probably tripped over, and therefore if there is a payout, that would be a higher payout than what we would potentially have to pay. Love to know how you trial drunk people hanging on the product. But I'd imagine that's a conversation for later. Um, could you install one for my neighbour tomorrow? Somebody asks. <laughs> um, we would love to be able to uh, do that, but obviously we want to make sure we do this correctly, which will involve both permissions and insurance and making sure that we meet all the regulations and so on. So, absolutely, we'd love to, but probably not just yet. If your neighbour has uh, their own property, then we can install it on their own property. Yes. Brilliant I stuff. That brings us to time. Thank you very much indeed. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> That brings us on to our final innovator today. And please put your hands together, uh, give a very warm welcome to Team uh, Blue Nose representing Joe. The mission of Blue Nose is to reduce the fuel consumption of the shipping industry. My name is Joey, Joey Sanga. I am a co-founder of Blue Nose. That mission came from an observation. On the planet, there are 5,000 ships that are solely responsible for 378 million tons of CO2. That's 1% of the global CO2 emissions. Those ships are container ships. When we came across those numbers, we felt compelled to act. But we didn't know how good a time it was to do so. On one hand, we have the ever-growing price of fuel, and on the other, we have new regulation shaking the industry, namely the CII, for Carbon Intensity Indicator. It's a grade of the carbon footprint of a ship. If that grade is too bad for too long, the ship can be barred from sailing. So there is a real um, legal incentive for ship owners. Our solution is to improve the aerodynamics of container ships. We created a design tool that allows us to generate optimized structures that profile the, um, streamline the profile of the ship, reduce air drag, and thus reduce fuel consumption. Our business model is to sell that equipment to ship owner as a one-stop shop. Uh, we then outsource manufacturing and installation. Uh, depending, depending on operational condition, we can save up to 5% uh, fuel consumption. 
that's equivalent to $1.1 million per ship annually, um, with a retail price set below 2.5 million. Uh, we have a payback under three, three years, including maintenance. Um, when we speak about the environmental impact, we can save up to 6,000 tons of CO2 per ship per year. And if our solution was deployed on the, on, on the entire fleet, we would save up to 8 million tons of CO2 per year. That's equivalent to 2 million cars off the roads each year. We are taking on a market that is estimated at more than $12 billion. We are going to concentrate on the European market. Um, currently, being pre-product, we have three client conversations at an MOU level. We have a lot of competition, but we, have, we are the only one that is at the same time um, non-dependent weather condition, installable outside of dry dock and retrofit. Um, Thanks to our innovation, we are currently patent pending in the UK and recently filed a PCT extension. We also received a grant from IBM of 120,000 uh, pound. The team is comprised of myself, a co-founder and CTO, and Leon Grier, co-founder and, and CEO. Uh, we also assembled a wonderful advisory board um, that has a lot of experience in the industry. Um, to cite only two of them, we have Jean-Marc Lacave, which is the ex-general director of CMA CGM, and Camille Beffa, which is the CEO of Fluid Refus Armateur. CMA CGM is one of the top five ship owners in the, in the world, and Fluid Refus Armateur is one of the top five in France. Uh, so to sum it up, we are patent pending with a PCT extension. We have three MOUs, and we evolved in an environment that is uh, regulation driven. So if you are interested in turning all of that into impact, we're looking for half a million uh, pounds. Thank you for your attention. Uh, well done, and uh, we welcome your team member for questions. And it's the final round of questions now. Um, and let's kick off with one about why this has never been done before. Um, this has never been done before for two main reasons. Um, I would say um, the, the, the principal reason is the, the fact that new regulation is coming into force um, in the last few years that is um, really, um, I would say, forcing ship owners to take action. And that's why it wasn't necessarily economically viable to do it before, but now it is. And also we're seeing in the, the ship of the, the new builds that will come in the next decade that they start to integrate those type of solutions in their new design. We've had a question in about um, shipping being very conservative. What's your route to market designers, owners, operators, for example? You can answer it. So I, can, I don't know if you hear me. I think you do. So uh, one of the main routes that we're going to go through is through design offices. So most often ship owners have... I want to say like privileged relationships with one or two design office that have the, I want to say the advantage to bring innovation to those ship owners. And so they look onto those design offices for new technology in order to improve the efficiency of their fleet. And currently we are in conversation with some of the most influential in France and in the UK. And we hope to bring our technology through those channels mainly. We're also of course present in many different conferences and physical uh, meeting events, uh, because it's also a, a, a sector where you also meet a lot of people physically. And um, we've had another question about what the life expectancy of your design solution and how sustainability um, is the design solution itself. Yeah, uh, currently the life expectancy of the solution is 15 years. It is equal to the average uh, life expectancy of a, of a ship um, sailing out there. Um, for the sustainability, we did a, a life cycle assessment, and we are carbon neutral under uh, four, months, four months of uh, utilization. Um, does it not add more weight to the ship, one audience member asks? Um, it does add more weight, uh, but all of that is taken into account uh, when we do the efficiency uh, uh, simulations. And um, what's your uh, biggest challenge and opportunity? He's giving me the difficult question. 
Um, so at the moment, one of the biggest challenge uh, is for us to develop the first MVP, ownership. And so we're taking, uh, I want to say, the different steps and iteration that are taking us there. So first of all, is creating a collaboration and a network of the different stakeholders that are necessary in order to make that uh, something true. Uh, and amongst them, of course, uh, shipyards that we're currently discussing with, especially the one in Marseille, uh, <coughs> ship design offices, as I mentioned, certification offices, mainly Bureau Veritas in France. Um, and also in terms of like main step that uh, we are gonna go through to convince the market is a prototype that is gonna be built on land uh, in order to test some of the technology and uh, of course test some uh, wave impact and corrosion on our prototype uh, in order to validate some of the biggest, uh, I want to say, uh, pain point of the technology. Um, how about the material the structure is made of? Okay, I can go through. So uh, what I just mentioned is also a part uh, of, I mean, the answer of that question. Uh, so currently there's two different ways to construct that structure. Uh, the first one is more conventional. It's going to use uh, metal sheet panels. It's a material that the industry is very used to, and people know how to work that material. Um, but at Bruno's, we want also to introduce novel material technology <coughs> and structural strategy to that industry. And that's also uh, some of the topic that the patent that we have uh, deposited covers. Um, and so part of uh, the validation of using new materials and new uh, structural strategy is to build it on land and do all of those testings. So, yeah. I think that brings us to time. Thank you very much indeed. Well done. Thank you very much. Um, and that brings to a close our round of pitches this afternoon. It's now time to head to menti.com for the final time um, to score the last round of teams that you've just seen. And I'm just going to give you a few moments to do that using the QR code again on the screen and the menti.com site. The code is 1405127. Okay, it looks as though most of you um, have finished, but please carry on. Um, while we're waiting for those scores to come in, um, please welcome back to the stage the director of Undaunted, Alyssa Gilbert. Okay, well, thank you all um, for staying the distance today. I hope you were all inspired by both the innovators and the breadth of their ideas. Uh, just to give you a bit of a feel of what they've been doing to get here, when they start with us, which was nearly 12 months ago, they come with an idea, a small sort of tested, piloted concept, um, usually tested in the lab, with some idea of their customers, but very limited customer testing uh, and, and really not always a clear business model. And the work that they've put in to be able to make these presentations to you is really just enormous. We've seen them develop their business skills, their skills in pitching and communicating their ideas. In many cases, the technical design of their product and many of these businesses have changed their proposition, maybe quite significantly from what it started as because of their understanding of the marketplace. So it's always really nice for us to see them to be able to present at the end of the year. So it's, it's a real journey that they go on. Um, I did want to speak a little bit also about a couple of the other things that we have coming up that round out the kind of activities we're doing at Undaunted to make London and the UK a great place to do climate innovation. As I mentioned when I spoke before, one of the things that we're doing is working really hard to build a healthy, interesting, varied pipeline of ideas coming in at the beginning part. And one of the important partners that we work with in doing that is one of Imperial College's student-run organizations called the Climate Entrepreneurship Club. 
This is a great group of students. And what they do is they try to attract students at Imperial and also elsewhere and encourage them to try and think about becoming climate entrepreneurs. And this year, they're also trying to reach out to other students across the London universities. They'll be holding an event here that we're sponsoring on the 25th of October. Um, so I, all of you in the audience who are part of London's climate ecosystem, um, please do promote that event. We'll be advertising it shortly on our channels. And let's try and get as many new innovators in as possible. Many of those people go on to be the innovators that you see on the stage here because they're bringing in technical expertise through the courses that they're studying, through some of the research they're doing in their PhDs, and through their connections. And so that's a really important part of building the pipeline. So that's the first thing I wanted to talk about. And the second one is at the other end. When the companies that you see here today graduate um, and move on, many of them, whilst extremely developed, are still at the earliest stages of their journey. And one of the biggest challenges of being a climate innovator is that many of these businesses that you see are creating really exciting new products and services, but they're creating products and services that are fit for the future. They are fit for the zero carbon climate resilient future that unfortunately, in case you didn't notice, is not where we live right now. <laughs> what this means is that their customers are often the early adopters, but the bulk of the market isn't yet ready for their solutions. And so what we're trying to do here also is build a bridge and help widen the marketplace for this group of innovators after they graduate from us. Um, so what does this mean in practice? Well, we're starting a new program in the next month or so, focusing on the built environment. Well, we'll be inviting groups of built environment startups or scale-ups in the climate space. And we're going to be bringing them together with important actors in the built environment who might be project developers, they might be policymakers, they might be architects, designers, planners. And what we're trying to do is go beyond the initial ideas that we already have, our understanding of what the barriers are to taking up these new technologies in the marketplace, and try to build solutions over the course of a year by bringing those startups and scale-ups together. So again, my plea to you is multiple fold. First of all, we're advertising some positions for people to run this program. So if you see those and you know people who are experienced either in innovation or the built environment who would be a great fit to help us run this program, please get them to apply. Um, the second thing is we're really looking for those marketplace makers, those partners to come and meet with our built environment startups and scale-ups. So again, if any of you in the audience are those people or who know those people, please send them our way. And finally, we'll shortly be advertising for for a cohort of startups or scale-ups to join that program. So again, there's an opportunity there. And I guess finally, while we're starting that program in the built environment, it's something that I believe is a challenge across all sectors in the economy. So in an ideal world, we wouldn't be doing this just for built environment startups and scale-ups. We'd be doing this in a parallel set of sectors. You know, we'd be doing it for transport. We'd be doing it for heavy industry. We'd be doing it, you know, for example, um, for greenhouse gas removal. And so if you are also interested in working with us to build a program like that across the other sectors, we'd be really interested in hearing from you and working together. Um, if you're keen, if you like events, um, there'll be an event um, at Sustainable Ventures on the 3rd of October, where we'll be talking about that program together with our partners, Sustainable Ventures and West London Business, um, which is a, there's a wider program of offer there as well. So with that, I'm going to look to my colleagues. I think we're ready to now announce the winners. Um, I think Rhea is going to come back on stage. And thanks to all of your scoring, we're going to offer some prizes. They're not enormous, but they're a token <laughs> of our appreciation. Uh, symbolic prizes. So, yeah. um, <laughs> well, they're real prizes, I guess. Yes, real prizes with some symbolism. Um, Alyssa's going to stick around on stage just to hand out those prizes. And just a reminder, um, before we announce the three top winners that uh, teams today were being scored on their uh, commercial potential, their climate impact of their innovation, and the quality of their pitch. Thank you very much indeed uh, for uh, your scores. Before we announce them, can I just ask for a round of applause for all all of the teams who pitched today and uh, yeah, well um, and for the teams that are about to be announced in third second and first place we ask that you just come to the stage to receive your uh, award and just pose for a photo for a moment before filing back off uh, so with no further ado in um, third place today please put your hands together for Blue Nose. Congratulations. 
Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, moving on to uh, second place based on the uh, audience vote and with another very impressive prize. <laughs> Please put your hands together for Diary Cycle. Congratulations. And in first place, with um, a, a very big prize, <laughs> please put your hands together for our top audience winner of the day, Wonky Collective. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. I think we should all come back. For a We're going to do one Sorry, group photo. Just hang on one second. <laughs> yeah, we all, we all come stand in line. Oh, wow. One group picture, like Olympic style podium. <laughs> Um, huge congrats to all of our audience winners and, of course, to all of the teams who pitched here today. It really is no small feat uh, to uh, pitch their startups to you, and I think everyone did a really, really fantastic job. And um, Before you leave, please do pledge your uh, support using Mentimeter for any of the teams that caught your interest today. And if you want to connect with them, um, the form is now available on Mentimeter, and it will continue to be open not just throughout this evening but throughout the rest of the week. Um, so please do take a couple of moments to fill that out. Um, that just leaves me to say, please do join us for um, drinks in the beautiful library and Georgian rooms of the RI, just through the room here, just through the door here. Um, and as you will have already seen, all of our startups um, have standing tables. They should be really easy to find if they're not members of the Undaunted team are all over the place, and I'm sure they'll point you in the right direction. Um, Final request, if you've got a lanyard, um, please do just leave um, the lanyard itself, not the name tag, um, in. I'm told there will be boxes placed to exit, so please leave that there. Um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you.